for 48 different behaviors. Exercise, diet, anxiety, uh, adherence with uh, anti uh, hypertensives, uh, uh, bulimia, anorexia. You name your favorite behavior, and it's in here, from 10 different countries. And you would think you'd get just noise. Instead, you get this incredibly elegant figure, okay? I mean, I want to put this on my wall, it is so elegant. And my son is, a, is an astrophysicist, and he says in, in astrophysics and physics, we know something's valid when it's elegant. <laughs> what does it say? In pre-contemplation, cons of changing outweigh the pros. Pros go up significantly from pre-contemplation to contemplation. Tied here, absolutely tied. Talk about ambivalence, right? Talk about doubt. Is it worth it? Is it not? Pros pass up, cons come down, keep separating. And so what does it tell us? It gives us a nice you know, guide in terms of the first principles to help people progress. We need, if they're in pre-contemplation, have the pros go up. Right? So we have somebody who's a couch potato in pre-contemplation. We say, let's talk about it. what are the kind of benefits you could get from some regular exercise, like a half hour of walking a day. And we take and chart that. That, may, that they typically will come up with five or six. We let them know that there's over 60 scientific benefits. And all we're going to do is challenge you is to double your list. See if you can do that between now and the next time we meet. Or if we're having a group thing. What we would do is we would have an exercise where we would go and each one would try to add a new pro. And if they didn't have a new one, they could say, I pass. And we see how many of those can we get? And we're really educating each other and also reflecting on our own uh, <coughs> pros. Now, what we say to folks is, this is the bargain basement of behavior. There's nothing you can do with your time that can give you as many benefits. Now, do you like bargains? Yes. <laughs> this is the behavior for you. Right? And how long will you take driving around the parking lot at the mall trying to get closer to that bar? <laughs> We want to speak their language you know, in terms of how, what they can identify with. Now, what's the number one con for regular physical activity or exercise? A con, right? Time is the number one con in Taiwan. It's the number one con in Mexico. And it's the number one con amongst retired Americans. <laughs> so you see how important it is. Right? But don't doubt how busy retired people can be. So we've got clear things. First the pros have to go up, then the cons start to come down. We want the pros still to be going up. One way to, re to reduce the cons is if I only get five benefits from my time, I won't be as motivated, as prepared as if I get 55 benefits. And then as we build that list, when it comes time to take and go to action, do you make a to-do list? Okay. One of the things we say is, Complex below the surface, simple techniques above the surface. Why do we use to-do lists? Because they, they have at least three major change processes that they contain. So, this week, walking for my heart. Next week, walking for my health. The following week, walking for my self-esteem. Walking for my sleep. Walking for my grandkids. Walking for my productivity. Walking for my immune system. Pretty soon I could be running. <laughs> but if we want people to be motivated, we can have them walking for my weight, walking for my weight. After a while, that starts to give a little. But more importantly is, we want our wellness programs, and we now call them well-being programs. We want our well-being programs to be enhancing the, somebody's sense of themselves, to be committed to their body, their self, and to others, like their grandkids, like their company. Okay? So that this is not just for one part of me. This is for all of me. And again, I think specialists in particular in medicine overemphasize one part of us. So, um, that's, I'm going to go just touch on this. It gets more complicated. But complicated above the surface, simple below the surface. Just so you know, we have programs that have two questions, can address how well somebody's using each one of these change processes, uh, with pros and cons, three questions, can give them feedback, hey, compared to your peers, you're underestimating the benefits of changing, then 
uh, next time they interact, congratulations, your pros have gone up. That means you're progressing. It means your, your uh, uh, efforts are paying off. Here, simply, these are fancy names. This is uh, cognitive, affective, evaluative. This could be education. Uh, it could be information. What we use most often is feedback. Congratulations, you progressed two stages. That means you about triple the chances you'll quit smoking in the next few months. Otherwise, without that feedback, anything changed? No, I'm still smoking. So keep in mind, your employee population has an action model of change. And they will assess things by action. And it's like the people with a heart attack. They're not going to show up if they aren't ready and they assume your program is going to look to pressure them, coerce them to take uh, action. Look at this 30 second spot in California using this model, speaking to the <coughs> contemplators on television. Man clearly in grief saying, I always feared that my smoking would cause lung cancer. I always worried that my smoking would lead to an early death, but I never imagined it would happen to my wife. Then on the screen, 50,000 deaths a year due to passive smoking in the U.S. 30 seconds, three sophisticated change processes, information, emotion, and you can re reduce that fear, that guilt, and reevaluating how my change is going to impact on others as well as on myself. So it's like, why do we use pharmaceuticals so much? Complex chemical formulas below the surface, simple steps one a day above the surface. So don't get intimidated by the complexity here because the techniques that your employees will be using are quite simple. Uh, here, this is self-evaluation. How do I think and feel about myself as a uh, uh, couch potato? A lot of uh, couch potatoes see joggers as road hazards, right? as a public nuisance. I mean, who wants to become one of those? So we need to get into the future. And then we move to, and, but different principles, different processes at different stages. We have to tailor our programs to where the person is at. Just like our communications with recruiting. We need to tailor it where they're at, and then we're giving them a big dose for what they need versus a one-size-fits-all and whether they get something from that or not enough from that. Self-liberation, that's willpower, making a commitment and a recommitment, reinforcement management. Typically, you want to encourage people to praise themselves, nice job, keep going, do it, because they expect to get reinforced by others. Re others don't reinforce them very much. And then they say, is this really worth it? So. Uh, and then so, uh, helping relationships, social support, substituting healthy alternatives for unhealthy alternatives, changing the environment, getting the junk food out of the house, getting the ashtrays out of the car. Uh, now, simple technique, that to-do list, okay? Look at how incredibly efficient we human beings have become. First, commitment, I write it down. Walking for my heart, it's on my list. Second. I take in, it cues me. Oh, I gotta walk, okay? Stimulus control, it cues me. Third, I cross it off, I reinforce myself. I mean, isn't that incredibly efficient that we, this is why ordinary people thought the stuff that we didn't know because over years we've developed some very efficient kind of techniques for applying these processes. Moving ahead. We're going to look at engagement. The number one concern amongst employers across the country, the number one concern about patient-centered medical homes, accountable care organizations, huge issue. Why? Because our field historically was not population-based. The action model was only for a small segment of the population. And with our clinical trials, all we cared about is, did we get enough people to be able to have statistical <coughs> power so we could find a difference if there was one. We didn't care if that was only 5%. If you look at clinical trials, the percentage of eligible people who get recruited to clinical trials is about 5%. What happens in terms of pharmaceuticals clinical trials? What do they do? Do they try to get 90% participation and engagement? Heck no. They screen for the most compliant people they can find. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if it's 5% that are compliant. 
And then once they take their medications out to the real world, what's the number one problem? Non-compliant, right? Because they screen that problem out. And one of the ways you can get higher efficacy is screen for your most motivated people. And that's one of the things you have to watch. When you go to say, what programs am I going to use? They can say, well, look at the efficacy we have. Well, what percentage of the population participates? If you have higher efficacy but 5% of participation, you're not going to have much impact to start with. Versus even lower efficacy but 75% participation. You see the point there? Because you're concerned with populations, not just with small percentages of folks. So we start with reach. How do we reach most people? Historically, we left it to the healthcare system. And what did the healthcare system do? It waited for them to reach out for help. <clears throat> well, we need to, we teach health professionals, you have to think of behaviors like smoking, exercise, diet, as silent killers, the way you think of hypertension. And you don't wait for somebody to come in to ask about hypertension. You proactively reach out to them. And so that's one of the first things we have to do. Once we reach out, do we recruit them to our program? And that we would measure by, they start on the first session, the first interaction. Um, uh, one of the leading uh, social network gaming companies, uh, actually headquartered here in Massachusetts, reached out, had reached a lot high of lots of people, but recruited only 17% of those people. So you see, each step, you can either strengthen your impact or you can weaken your impact of your program. Then once you reach them, do you retain them? And here, historically, with weight management programs, the percentage of people who would finish 12 sessions was typically 30, 20 to 30 percent. Okay? With alcohol programs, similar kind of thing. So again, at each step, we are at risk of having less impact. And then, where it gets tricky. Here, we are having, trying to engage people in the intervention, in the program, right? We reach them, we, they start, they continue, but are they progressing? And we'll see, like when we use incentives, people can go through the motion. So yes, they're in the sessions, yes, they're interacting with it, but if they're not progressing, we can lose impact. So we're actually shifting engagement from treatment process engagement to change process engagement. You get that? Okay. Treatment. I mean, first, we want to engage them in the program. Now, don't assume because they're in the program that that means they're automatically engaged in the change process. They can go through the motion. And so we see progress, like you're progressing on stages. We can give them feedback about that. That can help them to continue. Ultimately, we want to see success. They go from, not at, from at risk to not at risk. We don't just count improvement, okay? Because improvement may not have much health impact. It may not have any cost impact. We want to have somebody who goes from public health who is not at criteria, like not walking 30 minutes a day, to walk in 30 minutes a day. With smoking, we all agree on the criteria, from smoking to not smoking, and that's the kind of outcome we want. Then, do we sustain engagement? Because one of the things, again, is your highest risk, highest cost, and most Americans have multiple risk behaviors, you may need to sustain them so they can be changing other behaviors as well. Another leading uh, uh, social network company with uh, uh, Serious Gaming for Health had great recruitment, great uh, retention, with a uh, major employer in Rhode Island. But when they went back to the second campaign, it just bombed. It bombed. Because we got, we got called in to consult in terms of what's the alternative, what could they do. Why did it bomb? Well, we, got, we have to recognize, and this may step on some toes. But wellness tends to be all too much a matter of fashions and fads, without enough facts. And what happened in this, uh, with this company was, yeah, people had fun, but they didn't change. Okay? And so they said, well, do I want to do that again and spend my time 
I want to, you know, if I'm here for help, then I want to be able to see a uh, much more kind of benefit that way. So you see how this is, we call this the continuum of engagement. Same issues for patient engagement, employee engagement, and what are the factors that affect? What's important here is, just like you saw pros and con principles holding for 48 different behaviors, stage is the best predictor of who you reach when you reach out. It's the best predictor of who you recruit. It's the best predictor of who you retain. It's the best predictor of who progresses. It's the best predictor of who reaches success. And it's the pre best predictor of who you will sustain. If you're not using stage, good luck with engagement. Because right? we're talking about the number one construct that is, drives most each of these kinds of phases. <coughs> now, that means we need to use communication. Right? Keep in mind, we're up against a mental model that is action. And the majority of your folks, employees, don't have anything but an action model. And they're not ready to take action. So when you go to recruit them, if you're offering action, don't be surprised if you don't get a whole lot of folks signing up, or showing up, or finishing up, or ending up better off. And that's what we showed with Kaiser. They made a big effort to recruit people, it's an action program, and it bombed. Right? Let's just look at some of the, the kind of communication we need to do. We need to let people know that wherever they're at, we can work with that. We need to use icons, symbols, red light, not ready, yellow light, getting ready, green light, ready. Ready or not, we can be of help. That is new to them. I, I did a workshop in uh, Appalachia. I asked how many people knew about the stages of change. About 10%, and that was the professionals in the audience. Did they know what stage you're in for a particular behavior? If they did, did they know how to progress? Number one reason why people fail when they go to try to change, number one reason, they don't know how. They don't know the stages. If they do, they don't know what stage you're in. If they do, they don't know what to progress. And so this is something, again, we speak in clear language, we speak in symbols that, that they can uh, empathize with, and we can engage. And we have evidence of how many more you can engage just with that kind of communication. Let's go back. Incentive. All right? Clearly, if you want to maximize your participation, incentives will be important. Because keep in mind, most employees, are not prepared to engage in wellness programs. Okay? They're in earlier stages. But they are prepared to trade time for money. That's what it means to be an employee. Now, one of the issues about incentives is, will that cause them just to go through the motion? If they have to complete three sessions over the year in, in order to get, not have to pay more for their health care, which, by the way, is I we see is by far the, the uh, incentive approach that drives the most uh, uh, participation. But they could take and do those three sessions. Our best practices: three interactions over the 12 months, and we can record that. They can get their incentives. But we need to have programs that can take these extrinsic motivations and transform them into intrinsic motivations. Because if I'm doing it for money, I'm engaged in the treatment process, I'm not engaged in the change process. Got it? Okay. So let, let's uh, look at a dramatic example. Air Force. U.S. military wants to be smoke free. So the Air Force and basic training in San Antonio, six weeks, if you smoke, you have to be totally abstinent for the six weeks. And they would have random blood draws to test to see whether you had any coating in your blood and indicated that you had smoke. Now, what was the incentive? The incentive was incredibly powerful. The incentive was, if you were found to have coating in your blood, you would have to take and repeat basic training. <laughs> That's a powerful... How much smoke you know in that six weeks? 
Zero. You want to take and show amazing kind of impact on employee behavior? Now, after that six weeks of total absence, I mean the absence curves, you know, the, the rate of, of uh, absence drops rapidly, the relapse curves way under 50% reach six weeks. Okay? So here you have the six weeks of, so what's the recidivism rate at 12 months? What's the recidivism rate at 12 months? 50% higher than that? How much? 100%. 100%. Good, but higher than that? Okay. 123%. How can that be? That means that all the enlisted people who weren't smoking at the start were smoking 12 months later. And we concluded the Air Force was a major risk factor for the enlisted people's health. Now, take one principle, raising those pros, with people in pre-contemplation, intending to go back to smoking as soon as basic training is over, and you see it, as soon as it's over, they light up, as soon as people get out of the prison, they light up. They've been absent for years, and they light up. As soon as people get out of the hospital, they light up, okay? One session, 45 minutes, employee interaction around what are the benefits of staying absent and interacting around all the benefits and pros and which ones are most important to you. And for those who are intending to go back to smoking immediately, 12 months later, five times as many of those quit smoking, stayed quit, than those in the control group. And that was 7,000 people in the treatment group. Okay. Look at the power. This is one of the things that, that we are up against. Is these are disruptive solutions. What they do is they disrupt our mental, mental models. We would believe no way could 45 minutes impact when you've got the curve going in the wrong direction, 123% recidivism. You want robust programs, but let me show you the first time we applied this model. We compared this against American Lung Association, action-oriented manuals. This was home-based, because we know if we expect people to come into the clinic, that's a big barrier right from the start. And so the more we can have them do it at work, do it at home, the more we can in, engage. Uh, we did stage match manuals. Then we did stage match computers. The computer would assess what stage you're in and give them feedback. It would assess and it could give them feedback. Here's the first two most important steps you could take to move ahead. We have like a HRI rather than HRA. HRI assesses what state, what risk they have what stage you're in, and then it's HRI because it's health risk intervention. And then it immediately gives them the two most important steps that they could take to be uh, progressing to the next stage. Um, and it gives them feedback about those processes and reinforcement as they're going, plus management. Then we added what up to then was the highest efficacy, trained counselors, telephonic at home, outreach to them, proactive, plus the computers, plus the manuals, and this is like a horse race bet. So you make your bets. Which one of these treatments will have the greatest efficacy? This is on smoking with uh, about 800 participants, and here's what we see. Treatment ends at six months, okay? Computers alone and computers plus counselors about tied at six months. Who levels off? The counselors. Who keeps going after treatment? The computers. This is a great sign of engagement in the treatment process, in the change process, right? Tra treatment ends, change continues. Okay? Now, our counselors got depressed. My <laughs> <laughs> computers told them to seek social support. Okay? We did not expect this. We bet this would be the best. Yeah. But what does this say? This is important for small employers. This says more is not necessarily better, and more costly is not necessarily better. Okay? Very important message from a number of perspectives. Okay? So, next kind of criteria. You want to have robust programs. Do they take and work across very different kinds of populations? 
because employers are concerned. My employees are unique. And how can I have confidence that this is likely to have the same impact with them? And so you want to look at different populations. And what we looked at is populations where our stereotypes are, they can't change, or they can't change nearly as effectively. What do we say about old dogs? You can't teach them new tricks, right? Let's see how old dogs did. Okay. Whoops. Here's the old dogs. Who does best? The old dogs. Now, I've changed the label. Being one of these, I now call us smart dogs. <laughs> now, let's look at some of our minority populations that uh, disadvantage, often stereotype, not having the same amount. Oh, this is adolescent. Actually, this is even better. Surgeon General's report said, forget them. You can't reach adolescents. If you reach them, you can't recruit them. If you recruit them, you can't change them. This is with uh, uh, Kaiser out in the, using our programs. They recruited 65% of the smoking teens in their primary care, and they get outcomes just like we see with Next would be in terms of with African Americans, we see a couple percentage points better. With Hispanic Americans, even better. And then, what about smokers with mental health problems? Stereotype is, and actually the literature says, if somebody even has a history of depression, they will fail with quitting smoking. Even a history, you don't have to be depressed. Yet. Folks in California used our programs proactively reached out to smokers and depression clinics, got them to participate, randomly assigned to control room, and how did they, oh, by the way, I should let you know this. Today, about 50% of all cigarettes are bought by smokers with mental illness. But until our programs, there were no evidence-based programs for those smokers. And when you're trying to help smokers, you've got to be assuming half of them are likely to have uh, emotional, mental kind of issues, and you want programs that are robust for them as well. And what do we get? Just like we get with regular folks. And then the one I'm most proud of is with patients with acute episodes of major mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, okay, major depression, proactively recruited them to smoking cessation, and Two and a half times better than the control. Not quite as good as our average smoker, but the other thing was a year later, those who were in the treatment group had significantly less rehospitalization. Talk about impact on cost. Right? Talk about impact on mental health. Right? So, and yet the stereotype was there. You don't touch smoking with these patients. They're using it for stimulating themselves, using it for reinforcing themselves. Yeah. The point here is you want robust programs because with small employees, you're going to have a great deal of diversity, a lot of differences. You're not going to have a larger population in which you can generalize more into larger samples. And so you want to again have subgroups that are doing uh, as well here. Now, volatile behavior, I told you about this. I'm going to just Focus on one part. Historically, one behavior at a time. Hard enough to change one, you'll overwhelm people. Now we're showing we can do simultaneous. But here's the one that, that we're really capitalizing on. Here's the question. If somebody takes and is successful with one behavior, like quitting smoking, will they be more or less successful with a second behavior, like changing their diet? More. And why would you predict that they would be more? Success, uh, sense of power. Sense of power. More motivated. More greater self-efficacy. Excellent. Yeah, they've learned how to change. Okay, they've learned how to change. Excellent. Now, with self-efficacy, with motivation, with power, if they change on their own in the control group, shouldn't they be more successful as well? Right? But look what we see here. Look what we see. And this is, this is just getting published. We see that in the control group, 
they're 15% less successful. In the treatment group, they're about three and a half times more successful. Did not predict it. We don't even understand why that is. Except our leading theory uh, is that this, these folks learn how to change. Remember, if you learn about those pros in, in our programs, we teach them, you can use these pros with other behaviors, the same principles, and so you can take and generalize, and you can take and be more effective with other things uh, as well. So, how do we use that? Keep in mind, what we are looking to do is to help you with your employees have briefer programs at lower cost, with less demands on the employee population, in order to maximize impact. And that is not just one behavior, <coughs> but multiple behaviors. Because Dee Eddington's work, and Dee is a friend and a colleague, and I love him, but we don't, just, we don't agree on much at all. <laughs> <laughs> he shows so. up. Your multiple risk people, risk go up, costs go up. Risk go down, costs go down. Next year, risk go up, costs go up. Risk go down, costs go down. And it's the multiple risk folks that are taking and driving them. And on average, and this was like 10 years ago, his data, on average, risk go down, costs go down, about $2,000 in healthcare. Okay? Just to give you, I mean, in terms of how much this can drive costs. Now, we're not gonna get into this as much, but the best evidence right now, and it's growing evidence, is that we look at savings in healthcare costs, but these risk behaviors account for three times as much cost in terms of lost productivity, in terms of presenteeism. I'm at work, but I'm not functioning well. And I'm not able to be at my best. And we, we have, frankly, we have a much, much better measure of presenteeism based on well-being, uh, because the other measures used to be based on chronic conditions. And yet we know chronic conditions don't affect presenteeism nearly as much as these kind of risk factors do. Okay? So um, keeping that in mind. So let's see how we apply it. Next one, we were working on uh, lipid management, cholesterol management. Multiple behavior challenge, but it doesn't have to be. Taking your medication. Now medication, here's a case where most, of, or many of the times, if you have treatment engagement, you also have change coming with it. Okay? It's not like you can go through our programs and not show any change, because you can answer them as fast as you want, because you want to get that uh, incentive at the end of the year. Here, if you stay engaged, you're likely to see change. But do we want people to just have low enough numbers? Or do we want them to have a healthy diet as well? Do we want them to be exercising as well? Or do we want them to say, hey, my numbers are fine. I can eat what I want. I don't have to exercise. Right? So primary behavior was medication. Secondary was exercise and diet. Spent most of the time in our program, again, digital, okay, this is not, this is computer to person, not counselor. And then with exercise and diet, the only stage, like in that HRI. Here's the two most important steps you can take to progress the next stage with exercise, to progress with the next stage with diet. Let's see how that works. This is adherence, and we see at 18 months, treatment ends here. Folks here, 45% non-adherent, 15% adherent with the medication, three times as much non-adherence here than in the treatment group. Okay? Now, what about with exercise and diet? Will we impact on that with just about 30 to 60 seconds of time spent on it? Three times? What we see is a doubling of exercise, about 45% going from at risk to not at risk, and similarly with diet. Okay? Now I'm going to uh, uh, finish up shortly so we can, we, can I go over to the seven minutes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Uh, we can get on a row instead of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what I want to show you next is um, a case study. Uh, a, this is a, a large employer, but with smaller sites across the country. Quite diverse population, uh, uh, 
more blue collar, more men. Uh, what they did was used incentives for participation. This was you paid more for your health care if you didn't participate. Okay. We got 92% participation that was sustained. After we were shown the impacts with the employees, then the, the dependents were incentivized as well. Okay. But that came uh, a couple years after. What we're going to look at is the percent that over time went from at risk to not at risk. We're going to compare it against a major review of wellness programs for employees that are in the literature, about 55 studies. They include randomized trials. They include famous case studies like Johnson & Johnson and Citibank. Okay? And then we'll also compare it against our randomized trials on each of the behaviors. So for example, with smoking, we've had smoking in at least eight randomized trials. So we get an average, and we know we've already seen robust with substance, and multiple trials with exercise. Okay? And the thing I also want to add for you is that the programs in the literature average about 50% participation over time. That, that's retention uh, over time used incentives of different types. Our clinical trials average about 70%. Our case study averaged about 90%. So remember with engagement, the more engagement you have, the more potential for greater impacts, as long as you have good efficacy. Let's look at what we see. This is exercise. This is from the 55 studies. Not all have exercise in there. The average was 14%. Okay. This is our clinical trials. Average about 48%. That's going from at risk to not at risk. And this was our case study, about 55%. With healthy diet, 4% here. Ours, 32%. Case study, about 44%. Now, if you want to see the impact, what's the impact on the employee population? These reduce unhealthy eating by about 2%. 50% okay? times 4%. You get it? Okay. So, 2%. The editing thing, wellness programs don't work. That's not much impact for the kind of effort and costs that are going into it. Here you multiply by 70%. Here you multiply by 90%. This is like 40% reduction in the prevalence of unhealthy eating compared to 2%. See the difference there? One of the factors I believe that is really causing more employees and more experts like the Eddington to conclude that wellness programs don't work is that our decision makers, HR folks, wellness champions, just don't have the evidence on what, in terms of making a decision that will give the highest impact at the best cost. It just isn't. And, and what has happened here? The field has gotten commoditized. And brokers basically tell, I mean, large employers using brokers, basically say, it doesn't matter. Cost is the big differentiator. Once you've commoditized, they're all equal, then what's the cheapest? But we like this one slide, okay? So you can see where there are, you know, where there are the differences. And what we are looking to do is to really help decision makers make more informed decisions, uh, and really also working with brokers to educate them that in fact you don't want to be. Now, it doesn't mean because you have higher impacts that you have to have higher costs. These are, you know, th this is. Uh, three interactions on the internet uh, over a year uh, with incentives uh, being not having to pay. Let me finish with this because I think smaller employers are challenged by needing more probes. Okay? Because uh, first of all, cost is a big factor. You can't distribute it across as many people. And so you want more benefits from it. And so you want to be looking not only at healthcare costs, but on uh, increased productivity. I'm going to finish with, with this trial. 
this was uh, almost 4,000 people from 39 states around the country. They averaged about four chronic conditions, so this would be more like in the disease management area. They had four risk factors, so high cost, high risk uh, folks. 75% uh, were either obese or overweight. 60% uh, were either depressed or had a history of depression. 60% had either smoker or history of smoking. I mean, this is a high risk group, okay? 25% on uh, Medicare, 25% unemployed, 50% employed. We know from demographics, majority of these folks are working for small employers. Okay? That's how it is. Now, we did two interventions. One where we had exercise as the primary and stress management as secondary. The other was the opposite. Stress management as a primary, exercise as a secondary, we and a control group. Three interactions, okay? We showed that with, well, th this is uh, the highest group in this study was over 50% in terms of adverse or exercise versus not. I don't have, okay, stress management, about 75% uh, went from not managing stress effectively to managing stress effectively. But most important for the employee population, we not only saw reduction in risk, okay, major reduction in risk, and that's where wellness has been. But I, what I'm saying is the field is moving to well-being. And well-being is much more like a World Health Organization view of health. It's not just the absence of disease in the absence of risk for disease. It's well-being, emotional well-being, physical well-being, social well-being. And what we showed was nice dramatic increases in emotional well-being. And emotional well-being is not just a reduction of anxiety, depression, stress, but an increase in happiness, an increase in joy, an increase in enjoyment. Okay? The one that we were most struck with this was a population where there were more people who were <clears throat> suffering or struggling than who were thriving. In the U.S., the only time we've seen more people suffering or struggling than were thriving was during the worst of our economic crash. And it was 12 months with billions of dollars spent before we got back to more people thriving. In this group, just like the crash, more people struggling and suffering than thriving. With the intervention, more people. We had a 70% increase in thriving. I am absolutely convinced. We don't want to just settle for lower risk. We want employees who are thriving, right? We want families that are thriving. We need more communities that are thriving. And we are in a breakthrough in this area where the kinds of programs that we can do can really impact not only on health risk and health costs, but thriving. I mean, it's one of the best relationships, emotional health, one of the best relationships with presenteeism, with productivity on the job. So, share that with you. We want to keep raising the bar because these are such important issues. So let me open up for questions. How does one keep working in the field and hopefully shifting from wellness to well-being? Where do we start? Where, where's the place that we, as the um, hopefully the agents of change? Where, okay, where good start? question. If we're mm -hmm. going to switch from wellness to well-being, where do we start? And that's a good question. First, <laughs> the goal for today goal for today is to help you progress one stage in this brief interaction. So if I help you to progress one stage from pre-contemplation to contemplation about well-being, great. From an action model to a stage model, great. That means you know, our time was a success here. Here's, here's where I would suggest starting. Start by assessing some of well-being. Okay? If most people use an HRA, include one that has well-being measures. And honestly, two questions to get at thriving, suffering, struggle. And then, what you can be looking at is, is our program impacting 
on emotional well-being? Is it impacting on thriving? And if not, then what could we add that could help uh, be changing that as well? The fact is, if you're getting high impacts on exercise or effective stress management, you are probably going to get high impacts on emotional <coughs> well-being and on, on thriving as well. But first, start in terms of assessing, see where your population is at, and then see uh, how they are progressing uh, over time. Okay, that was a really good concrete answer. I appreciate okay. Yeah, I can, some... be, I can be concrete too. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just like really <laughs> No, I, I, I'm, 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 my wife says I am dark green. Dark green is like heavily conceptual. Well, me too, maybe that's why I appreciate it. I'm just wondering if there's somewhere we can go to find or form or something we could use, a survey we could use for that assessment purpose. Um, how do you assess it? You know, you say assess the well-being of, of your people. How do you assess the well-being of your people? Well, Is there um, a questionnaire that you can use? Yeah, yeah, there are, there are assessment tools. And, and what you want to do, it's, it's the same with interventions. Uh, you, you know, again, I, I know that, that we like the freedom to be able to make up what we're doing, but having evidence-based assessments, evidence-based interventions is going to give you a lot more outcome, a lot more confidence. So yeah, there are uh, standardized ones. Um, I'm going to give you, th this is like a conflict, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I was telling someone today, when, when our kids went to get their PhDs, my wife said, i got to go back and keep up with the kids. <laughs> so she got a PhD in social work at Boston College, and then she started up a company based on this. And, and uh, she hired three of our new PhDs that were coming up. Uh, she, she's got a women's own company, seven PhDs, uh, all women, uh, and they, they just do really, really nice work. Anyhow, they have uh, some of these kind of measures, and it's a uh, uh, pro-change, uh, I think it's ProChangeBehaviorSystems.com. No, it's just ProChange, no hyphen, dot com. Okay. So. All right. Any other questions? Good being with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you.